Congressman James Clyburn of South Carolina is the House Majority Whip, and he joins me now. What is your reaction to that vote today, a vote that didn't have a lot of suspense because I think we suspected it would end up here? Well, I feel very strongly that this begins the process. That's all that's happened here. And we are going to move forward doing what we have to do. The vice president uh, spoke eloquently to the fact that we are going to move forward uh, with S-1, and we are going to move forward with the Voter Empowerment Act, which is a part of S-1, and the John R. Lewis uh, Voting Rights and Advancement Act. Now, you're going to look at what uh, Joe Manchin has put forward, uh, and I think uh, that Stacey Abrams has always already spoke favorably of it, and I, too, said that it's a great uh, first step. So let's take a look at what he's putting forward, and I think uh, that we ought to make a run at trying to get the votes that are necessary uh, to get it. But if we don't, uh, then I think it's time for us to take a hard look at the filibuster. And let me be clear. I have never asked that the filibuster uh, be eliminated. I do believe that we ought to do for constitutional issues what we've done uh, with uh, the budget. Reconciliation is used uh, in order for us to maintain the full faith and credit of the United States of America. And we ought to use reconciliation to maintain democratic principles and move forward with our pursuit of a more perfect union. So I just feel very strongly uh, that the filibuster can be maintained while at the same time not allow it to uh, uh, apply to constitutional issues, just as we don't let it apply uh, to budget issues. It, it, it's, a, it's really worth, I think, emphasizing this point for a moment, because there is at this point no conceptual coherence to the filibuster. There are two major exceptions. Reconciliation, which, again, is a sort of obscure budgetary process, budgetary process, but and then nominations. Right. And because the, we, we got rid of that and up to and including Supreme Court justices and judges who have lifetime tenure. There's no reason that was not handed down by Moses and the tablets or uh, conjured up by the founding fathers or delivered <laughs> there. That's right. complete happenstance that those are the two. No, that's categories. exactly right. Yeah. In fact, when you study this issue, will you find out that it was a, a, an oversight? Someone made a mistake uh, and it's been used uh, and uh, turned into a tradition. And so tradition means of itself that sometimes you got to have better laws, uh, get beyond tradition. And look, it's clear in Article 1, uh, Section 4 of the Constitution of the United States of America, that the federal government maintains control, must maintain control. If you look at the Federalist Papers, it's right there. Hamilton spoke to it very eloquently. On three pages there, he says, the federal elections must remain with the federal government. What you see here is Republicans trying to turn over congressional elections to states. That is exactly what is happening. And for uh, Mitch McConnell to say, this is a takeover on our part. It is just the opposite. How many Democrats in Georgia voted uh, for uh, that bill that they passed down there, or in Texas, or in Florida, or in Iowa, as you po just pointed out? Not a single Democrat voted for any of these. So to say that the law is no good unless you have bipartisan support will say to me that you don't believe in the 15th Amendment. Because the 15th Amendment, they gave blacks the right to vote, passed by one party vote. It's, a very, it's an excellent point, uh, the 15th Amendment, uh, 14th uh, as well, we should, we should note. In fact, a uh, big part of the country is under military rule, but that, that's, it, was a, it was a strange time in many ways. But the, the, the deeper question to me here, Congressman, is, that, is this idea of the, the sort of specter and to me kind of the, the code of federalizing elections when that is that we've been fighting on that turf forever about who controls elections, and this is not a new argument. No, it's not. Uh, and it has never uh, been a real problem before. Uh, as you know, uh, when I came along voting, I could not vote until I was 21. Uh, we have now lowered the voting age to 18. States didn't do that. The federal government did that. 
uh, decided that we were sending young men uh, at the age of 18 and 19, uh, 20 years old off the war, and they ought to have the right to vote on whether or not that should occur. And that's what the federal government, the Congress, used yeah. uh, to lower the voting age to 18. States came along later because they didn't want to have two systems. So this argument it is very clear. The history is there. The records are there. And I don't know why Mr. McConnell would stand on the Senate floor and misrepresent what is going on here the way he did. And that was the biggest misrepresentation I've seen from him in a long, long time.